many people will find this story about the Schumacher barn captivating. In January 2003, I came across an article posted on the internet, written by Bill Bolin of Slayton, Minnesota. The article was titled, Follow the ACO Brick Road. This article piqued my interest, as I like farming, architecture, bricks, history, and Minnesota. Bill Boland's article talked about the history of ACO silos, the Oaks Brick Company of Springfield, Minnesota, and how ACO silos were starting to disappear. One particular sentence caught my eye. It said, Possibly the most beautiful Oaks Brick barn and silo still standing is on the Bob and Carol Rickey farm near Fairfax. I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota, and my job took me to Grand Forks. Near my homes in both places were ACO silos. Other than that, I really didn't know too much about them. Since Bill Bolin spent most of his life in southwest Minnesota, where the highest concentration of ACO silos are located, I gave his opinion a lot of weight. This barn and silo intrigued me. The Bolin article went on to say, A large framed picture of this barn and silo, taken shortly after its completion, hangs in the conference room of the Oaks Brick Company in Springfield, yet today. A brick company does not hang a large framed print of a barn and silo in a prominent place in their business unless they are proud of it too. In addition to Bill Boland's opinion on this being a beautiful barn and silo, the company that built the brick used in the barn and silo believed that too. That means something. In the spring and summer of 2003, I made plans to locate both the Oaks Brick Company in Springfield and the barn and silo on the Rickey Farm near Fairfax. In 2003, the Oaks Brick Company was still operating on the northeast edge of Springfield, Minnesota. I stopped at the little brick building out front and asked if I could see the large framed print of the barn and silo they had in their conference room. The people in the office were very accommodating and showed me the picture and gave me a tour of the plant. My recollection of the large framed print was one of disappointment. It seemed to me that the lighting on the barn and silo was poor, and if I remember correctly, vines or vegetation covered a lot of the barn. Both made it hard to judge the quality of the entire barn. However, when I located the barn on the Rickey Farm near Fairfax, it was not a disappointment. It really was a stunning barn, and there were two silos, not one. In the 17 years since my first visit to this barn and silos, I have seen only two other ACO brick barns with two silos. One of these has been torn down, and the other one only has the barn remaining. As for this barn on the Rickey farm, it stands there all by itself, which makes a person wonder why that is, and who paid for it to be built there. This led me to the story of the Schumacher family. Ernst Schumacher was born on October 7, 1846. He was born in Germany and was a shoemaker by trade. Shoemaker and Schumacher. In 1872, Ernst Schumacher immigrated to the United States, settling in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where he worked as a cobbler or a shoemaker. That same year, Ernst married Johanna Radiski, who was also a native of Germany. While in Wisconsin, the Schumachers had three children, Ernest, Helen, and Emma. In 1881, the Schumacher family moved from Milwaukee to New Ulm, Minnesota, I am not sure exactly what dates the Schumacher family was in New Ulm, but I did find an article in the New Ulm Weekly Review newspaper on July 13, 1881, that mentioned a shoemaker arriving in town. If this was Ernst Schumacher, it was not good timing. On July 15, 1881, a devastating tornado hit New Ulm, nearly wiping out the entire town. This might explain why it was stated that the Schumacher family only spent six weeks in New Ulm before moving to Cortland in Nicollet County. In Cortland, Ernst Schumacher continued his cobbler business for about 18 months. In addition, another daughter, Louisa, was born in Cortland. 
In 1883, Ernst purchased 160 acres of land in Cairo Township, Renville County. The Schumacher farm was near Rush Lake in the southwest quarter of Section 27. When the Schumacher family moved there, only a few acres of land had been broken and a log cabin had been built. The Schumachers moved into the log cabin and developed and diversified the farm. Here, four additional children were born, Pauline, Otto, G. Adolf, and Albert. Farming methods were tough originally, involving a lot of manual labor and horsepower. Over time, more horses were added and slightly larger implements were used. The Schumacher family was successful. In 1890, they built a 40 by 73 foot barn, likely of wood. This barn could hold 50 head of stock and 50 tons of hay. They also had a large silo, 14 by 40 feet, that could hold 140 tons of silage. The barn and silo were needed for their herd of Holstein cattle. In addition, they raised Chester White swine, barred rock chickens, bronze turkeys, and pearl guineas. The Schumachers also had an orchard, where they raised apples, plums, and compass cherries, in addition to small fruit and berries. It was a good life, but hard work. This is a picture of the Schumacher family taken in 1897, with one daughter missing. Ernst died several years later, in 1902, at the age of 56 years. Like many farms of the day, the Schumachers named their farm, calling it the Ideal Stock Farm. With the death of Ernst, the day-to-day -day operation of the farm turned over to Johanna and the children. Johanna was up to the challenge, being the leader of the family during a tough turn of events. Some of the children were able to attend grade school, walking to a school about a mile and a half away. Some of them could have been pictured here, in this stereo view taken in Cairo Township in 1898. The Schumachers attended the German Lutheran Church in Fairfax, which was built along the Minneapolis and St. Louis Railroad. In 1903, the Schumacher family built a new farmhouse, 18 by 26 feet, with an L, 18 by 20 feet, and a kitchen, 10 by 20 feet. This is not the actual farmhouse, but would be similar to it. One feature of the new house was hot air heat. Another sign of prosperity for the Schumacher family occurred in 1911, when Johanna bought a new Studebaker automobile, one of the first in the area. This vehicle helped the family with their farm and their mobility. In 1914, the family attended the Benson Corn and Alfalfa Exposition, which was like a regional fair. Held in Benson, Minnesota, it featured several notable speakers, including railroad magnate James J. Hill. 25,000 people attended the event, 12 bands battled for first prize, 16 candidates competed for the title of Queen, and a special room was built to show off the Blue Ribbon winners. Although it was a corn and alfalfa show, it weighed heavily toward corn. 50,000 ears of corn were entered, with prizes for several different categories. The Schumachers won first place for a single ear of corn from Renville County, which was a notable achievement. In 1917, the Schumachers added running water to their house and barn. It was likely an air pressure driven system like the one pictured here. Like many families at the time, they were also affected by World War I. Albert was drafted in late 1918, which was toward the end of the war, and he was released in early 1919. Another comfort arrived for the Schumacher family in 1919, which was electric lighting for the farm. The light was produced by a Delco 32-volt light plant, which was usually located in an outbuilding on the farm. The unit was powered by fuel and had a series of batteries. In November 1921, Johanna sold the farm to her three remaining children on the farm, Emma, G. Adolph, and Albert. Emma would have been 41 years old, G. Adolph 31, and Albert 27. Emma was the housekeeper, 
and G. Adolph and Albert worked the farm. However, all three children were unmarried. In 1924, the Schumachers added a garage and shop, much like this one. Big change occurred in 1926, when the Schumachers bought a John Deere D tractor and a three-row plow. They also purchased a case threshing machine. G. Adolph and Albert were in the prime of their lives from about 1926 to 1951. In addition to working their own farm, the brothers did custom work for their neighbors, like threshing. They could also fill silos like the ACO silo pictured here. However, with the dairy herd, a lot of their time was spent milking. In 1927, the Schumachers added a 20 by 48 foot James Way chicken house. Clearly, Emma, G. Adolph, and Albert were doing quite well. The crown jewel to their farm, a new 36 by 102 foot barn, was built in 1932. The Schumachers turned to the Loudon Machinery Company of Fairfield, Iowa to design the new barn. The drafts were returned on December 8, 1931. The brick and hollow brick for this barn came from the Oaks Brickyard in Springfield. Adolph Oaks advertised his products well and believed they should be used in every building on the farm. His bricks were a reddish-orange color. The lower level of the barn featured the Oaks brick and block. There was a drive through entrance on the north side of the barn, a milk room on the west side, two side windows on the second floor, and three cupolas on top. This top-down view of the first floor shows the drive through entrance, a middle driveway, the stock pens, and the milk room on the side. This photo shows how the first floor of the barn may have looked. In 1935, the two silos on the south side of the barn were added, along with a feed room. The Oaks brick silos were well-known and well-built. Johanna Schumacher died on May 1, 1944, at the age of 90 years. Albert married Erna Radiski Polson on April 2, 1949, when he was 54 years old. Radiski was also his mother's maiden name, which is likely how he came to know Erna. Obviously, they had no children. In 1957... G. Adolph and Albert Schumacher sold their dairy herd to make life easier. G. Adolph was 67 at the time, and Albert was 63. This is a photo of G. Adolph and Albert and Erna, taken late in life. Emma Schumacher died in 1971 at the age of 90. G. Adolph died in 1980, also at 90 years. Albert died in 1989 at the age of 94 including their mother, all three of the remaining children on the farm died in their 90s. As the three remaining children on the farm had no children, the land was sold to the neighboring Ricky family. The barn and silos are all that remain on the farmstead today. You can be the judge. Do you think it is possibly the most beautiful Oaks brick barn and silo still standing? Thanks to Bob Rickey for generously sharing historical information and the original barn plans for this video. That concludes the video. Please check out my websites at mnbricks.com and chaskabrick.com.